Well, welcome to another online Bible study video. I, I do pray that these videos have been helpful for you and have given you an opportunity to stay immersed in God's Word and to grow in your faith. Uh, this is not how the Christian life is supposed to be lived. And know that your staff, your elders, that we long to meet together with you in person again uh, as one unified body. Uh, we, we are anticipating that. We're looking forward to it. We're praying for you. We love you. We miss you. But until then, uh, I hope that you can watch these videos, that you can listen to them, you can read along with them, and see how you can apply the truths we learn about God's Word uh, to our own lives so we can continue to grow in the image of Christ, uh, even during this time of isolation and during a pandemic. Uh, and I want to encourage you, um, even if you're not a youth, even if you're not a teenager, watch these videos. There's still something we can all learn and grow in uh, from the study of God's Word. Uh, watch Pastor Andrew as he uh, delivers his message on Sunday mornings. And I would also encourage you on Tuesdays to check Facebook and the YouTube channel for the church and see Pastor Noah as he's been putting out videos that give the reasoning and why we sing certain songs, what's behind the lyrics and the importance of our musical worship. So please take advantage of these resources and, and I really just hope that they would be a blessing to you. Um, for today's study, I want us to talk about something that is essential to the Christian life, something that's a vital part. If you've been in and around church for any period of time, no doubt you've heard lots mentioned about prayer and what prayer is, the importance of prayer. And to put it in its simplest term, prayer is communication with God. That's what it is. Most of us know that, we're aware of that. But I want to walk through a passage in Scripture that will kind of lay out uh, some of the guidelines for how we go about praying to God. And so I want to go to Matthew chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, grab them, open them to Matthew chapter 6. Now, in the last, all the previous videos, we've been going over things pertaining to the gospel. And so that's kind of the focus of this year-long study that we've been doing. As I told you, it is a topical study, just looking at what it means to be rescued by Christ. And so in the last few weeks, we've looked at kind of the, the how we spread the gospel, the why we spread the gospel, to what that looks like, to the importance of our actions, the importance of our words, how we respond to the gospel. And then on Sunday nights, the youth, uh, we've been going through uh, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, looking at all the statements Jesus gives in the Sermon on the Mount where he will say something like, you've heard that it was said, and then he will quote something from the Mosaic Law, something from the book of Exodus. And then he'll say, but now I say to you. And he's not changing or adding to the law, but rather giving a proper interpretation and application of the law. Uh, he's going into greater detail to really explain because they had, uh, they had diluted God's law from the Old Testament and had really missed the forest for the trees, uh, to use a, a more modern phrase. They just didn't, uh, they had totally gotten off track with the whole purpose and intent behind the law. So Jesus is correcting their misguided view of what God's law requires of us. But in that Sermon on the Mount, he gives us an explanation of prayer. It's something we call the model prayer. And if you think about a model and what a model is, a model is not the real thing, but it's simply something there to replicate the real thing. I'm reminded of when I was a child, I used to love to get these hot rod cars, models, and put them together. You assemble them, you glue them, you snap everything together, and then you, you paint it and put decals. And they were fun to do, and it looked really neat. They could, if you really took your time and were careful, you could make these models look really nice but it's not the same detail it's not in as much precision as the actual hot rod car you are trying to replicate well in the same way this prayer is simply something uh, our words may not be exactly word for word what this is that's never the intention uh, of jesus in giving us this prayer but rather it's to give a a base idea of when you pray here's how you should pray so join me as we read Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 5. He says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door to pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, when we read that, one of the things that stands out to me is the fact that he tells us to go and to pray in secret. 
So thinking about this, this command to go pray in secret, it begs the question, is it wrong to pray in public? I mean, he's telling them in the passage, go to your father in secret and your father who hears you in secret will reward you. So is it okay to pray uh, if someone else is watching, someone else is around? Well, I want to point out, uh, maybe from a more broad look at Matthew chapter 6, a few other things that I think are critical for understanding why Jesus gives this command the way he does. Back up in Matthew 6, if you look at the first couple verses, he's talking about giving to the needy. When we give to those who are in need. And notice what he says in verse 3. He says, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And then if we go down further in the chapter, we see where he talks about the idea of fasting and how we should go about fasting. So look further in the chapter at 17. He says, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret. So once again, for giving to the needy and also for fasting, just like for prayer, Jesus is saying you need to do this in secret. What's the point? Why do we have to do these things in secret? And is it wrong for us to do these things if others know about them? Is it okay to give to the needy? Surely if someone's in need and there's other people watching me, it's not wrong of me to not give to that person in need. Surely we should still give to them. So how do we understand this? Well, let me point out something similar that all three of these things have in common. Go back to the beginning of Matthew 6 and let's read. As he's talking about giving to the needy, listen to what he says in verse 1. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people, and here's the key phrase, in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Verse 2 says, thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. Another key phrase, that they may be praised by others. And then if we go down to the passage we had just read about fasting, notice what he says there. He says, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces. Key phrase, that their fasting may be seen by others. And then in our portion uh, about prayer, notice what he says. When you pray, in verse 5, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners. Once again, key phrase, that they may be seen by others. And so the point Jesus is getting at is that our motives are absolutely critical to what we do to honor the Lord. You could take something as simple as these Bible study videos. I've never made a Bible study video and uploaded it online in my life until this pandemic hit. And my reason behind this is we've discussed as a church and thought this is a great way to put content out for you all, youth, adults, whoever, to view and to learn and grow in your faith. But the moment I start making videos and putting them online because I simply want to gain popularity, I want people uh, to see me, I want to get more likes and shares, uh, maybe I'm seeking that highly coveted blue check mark by my name on social media. The minute we start doing it for those reasons is the minute we enter into sin. You see, we don't do things for our own glory, but our ultimate goal should be to glorify Him. That should be our ultimate goal in life. I'm reminded of a quote from Dr. John Piper uh, that's kind of the motto of his ministry, Desiring God. It says that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. See, our ultimate satisfaction must not come from outward praise from other people, from accolades, from people recognizing us and giving us a pat on the back, but our ultimate goal should be to glorify God and, and to not simply have praises thrown our way from other sinful people around us. We that's why Jesus says, do these things in secret and make sure your heart is pure and at the right place. And when you go to the Lord in prayer, don't do it to try and show off to other people, but go to him in secret and pray to God your Father. Now look at the next few verses. Verse 7 says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. 
When we see this, we see that uh, we're not to use this high and lofty language. That's not our goal. We're not going to impress God with using some certain speech. It it's, goes back to what we just spoke about, not being showy or not trying to get our own praise, but we simply pray heartfelt prayers. Now let's see what that prayer looks like. He says, pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now when we see that first phrase where he says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. What does it mean to hallow someone's name? Simply put, it means to make holy their name. And we think about what we do as followers of Christ. It should be our goal to, to uh, make sure that God's name, that His renown is known, that He is made holy. Think about what Scripture has to say about this. Scripture has lots to tell us and to teach us about the character and the nature of God. We know that God is love. That's probably the most emphasized attribute uh, of God. We know that God is a God uh, the opposite of love is wrath. The more love you have, the more wrath you have to anything opposed to it. So we know that God is a wrathful God as well. He, will, he is a just God. He will exercise His wrath justly. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. He's a God of compassion. We could list numerous things. But of all these attributes, there's only one that's elevated to the third degree, what we call the superlative degree. So in the Hebrew language, you would repeat something, and that repetition would show importance and significance. And there's only one attribute of God that's mentioned three times again, and that is His holiness. God's Word tells us that God is holy, holy, holy. He's completely set apart. We need to remember that when we go to God in prayer. We're not simply praying in a flippant way as some people would refer to God as the big man or the man upstairs or something to that effect. No, no, no. We're praying to the very sovereign creator of the universe, a God who is holy, 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 set apart from everything else in his creation. Not just is he a God who's holy, holy, holy. He's our father. It says our father. And, and when we use that term father, we think of something that's a close relationship. And so this holy God, we're able to have close relationship with. And it says that he's in heaven, that he's not just simply limited to this earth as we are as, as human beings, but he's a holy God who's creator and sustainer of all things in heaven and on earth, and we have close relationship with him. When we go to God in prayer, it would do us well to remember those things, to put us in our proper place as we speak and communicate to this holy God. Next in verse 10, we see that it says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, when we talk about asking for God's kingdom to come, what are we really asking for? When we think about the kingdom of God, uh, I think we could best summarize it as the reign and rule uh, of God over the hearts and lives of his people. And so that's what his kingdom uh, is. And when we ask for that to come, that's saying, God, I want your reign, I want your rule to guide and direct my life. Now that's gonna cost us something. That's gonna require something of us. That's gonna mean we're gonna have to be willing to be submissive and to change and, and to shape our lives in accordance with God's will, not our own will. I think oftentimes when we think about prayer, our immediate thought is what do I want? Uh, what do I want God to do? And we tend to be very self-centered. I'm not picking on anyone in particular. I think we all struggle with that as sinful, fallen human beings. We, we think about me, myself, and I a lot. But what this is saying is, God, I want your kingdom to come. And whatever that means for my life, my career, my friends, my family, my habits, the words that I say, the thoughts that I have in my head, anything about my life, I want to shape that and conform that. To, well, it will best fulfill your will for my life. We pray for God's reign and rule. We pray for his kingdom to come. And we pray for his will to be done over and above our own will. Next, we see in verse 11, he says, Give us this day our daily bread. Now, we think about this idea of each day asking God for daily bread. It kind of, uh, once again, begs the question, what's wrong with praying for tomorrow's bread or a month from now or a year from now? 
we're in the middle of a pandemic and lots of us are trying to plan and look ahead at what does this look like for the life of the church in the future? Is there anything wrong with making plans in advance? Think about your personal life. Is there anything wrong with savings accounts? Anything wrong with retirement funds? Planning ahead, trying to prepare yourself and your family to where your children will have something you can leave behind for them. No, not at all. See, when we think about the totality of Scripture and what Scripture teaches us, we know that God is a God of order. He's not just a God of randomness or arbitrary, arbitrarily doing things haphazardly, but He's a God of control and order. Uh, we see that through Scripture. Even think about the way we refer to the universe around us. Uh, scientists call it the cosmos. That comes from the biblical languages. There are two words used, the cosmos, which is where we get our word cosmos, meaning the whole universe, and then chaos is the opposite word. Chaos is disorderly. The very world that God created is known and referred to as that which is orderly. And so if it's okay to, to think and plan ahead and have everything in order, why does he tell us pray each day for your daily bread? Well, simply put, it's a way of showing our reliance on God each and every day of our lives. Our continual reliance on his steadfastness, steadfastness to get us through life. I'm reminded of uh, the Israelites in the wilderness when, uh, in the book of Exodus, when they had, uh, were in the desert and they needed food and, and God gave them manna from heaven. But he told them, only gather enough for one day. If you gather more than that, it's going to have worms in it. It's going to all spoil. The point in that was to teach his people that he alone will sustain them. He is enough for them. They don't need to look outside and away from their God for more, that he is their true sustenance. And likewise, when we pray to God, we should pray each and every day. You shouldn't pray and think that covers you for a week or for a month or for a year, but rather every day we wake up and we go to God in prayer, knowing that he is the one we need to sustain us in life. Next we see in verse 12, he mentions forgiveness. He says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Here we see Jesus talking about the importance of forgiveness. He says, uh, forgive us our debts. And some people may wonder, well, if I'm already saved, I've already repented of my sins. I'm a follower of Christ. I know that salvation is eternal. I can't lose it. Uh, I like the old saying, if you could lose your salvation, you would lose your salvation. Um, but why do we have to continually ask forgiveness if I've already been forgiven? I've already been justified for my sins. Why do I do this? Well, I think the importance here is a showing a heart that truly has been transformed by the Holy Spirit that wants to follow after Christ and, and emulate Christ with our life. I mean, think about it. How much sense would it make for us to say, I'm grateful that God has saved me from my sins, but if I keep sinning, I know I'm supposed to look and act like Christ, but if I continue to sin, whatever, no big deal. It doesn't show a heart that sincerely wants to look like Christ and follow after Christ. And so, is this telling us that we have to forgive all the time perfectly? No. I think it's simply trying to get the point across that our life should be marked with trying to be forgiving uh, to others just as God has forgiven us. And that means we live a life of also asking forgiveness from God the Father for our sins as we struggle to try to emulate Christ with our life. Next, we see that he says in verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so here, uh, Jesus is praying that he would not be led into temptation, but delivered from evil. I think it's interesting that he says that I would be delivered from evil. You see, he's not, um, he's not simply wanting to bypass all evil. He knows that those bad things, those dark nights of the soul, those things are going to come. But rather, he's saying, deliver me, get me through them. That's what he's longing for. Likewise, we know that we live in a sinfully fallen world. Those difficult times and things are going to come. We must strive to simply uh, rely on God daily to get us through those difficult times. And next, we see in verse 14 and verses 15, he says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. 
And now here he seems to be um, saying more than what some of us may be comfortable with. I mean, think about it. He's saying, if you forgive others, then I will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, I'm not going to forgive you. So is Jesus telling us basically if you mess up and forget to forgive someone of something that now you forfeited your salvation, you're no longer saved because you didn't forgive like I forgave. No, I think this is the difference in what we would call the prescriptive versus the descriptive uh, passages in the Bible. So you have passages that are prescribing something and saying, if this is going to happen, this must take place. It's what we'd call specific teaching or didactic teaching on a certain topic. And there are other passages, you see this a lot in the parables especially, where it's simply descriptive. It's not saying this, this, and that must take place, but it's simply saying, I'm trying to give a general picture. I'm trying to describe something for you. And so that's what Jesus is giving us here. He's saying, look, if you're someone whose life is marked by not forgiving anyone, you're unwilling to forgive others, well then you show me that and I will show you someone who's not been transformed by the Holy Spirit. Keep in mind what the book of 1 John tells us, that the, the true mark of a Christian is love and obedience. If we truly love others and we want to obey God's word to be forgiving, how can we do those two things but yet not be willing to forgive people? If we want to love and obey God, we must do that. I'm reminded of what 1 John also says about uh, practicing sin. It says there in the middle of 1 John that those who practice lawlessness or those who practice sin will not see the kingdom of God. And that verse used to bother me because I would say, well, I practice sin. I'm a sinful person. I'm going to con continue to struggle with sin the rest of my life. Does that mean I'm not going to see God's kingdom one day? I'm not going to be saved. But the way we get those words from, I, I guess I would closely relate it to practicing sin being the same thing as when we think of a doctor. Who is a doctor? It's someone who practices medicine. Well, what do we call lawyers? Someone who practices law. And so a doctor is someone whose life is marked by a lifelong vocation of following after uh, of, uh, the study of medicine and trying to administer medicine to help those medically. A lawyer is someone whose vocational life is spent uh, practicing the study of law and the application of law. Likewise, somebody who lives a life of practicing sin, as mentioned in 1 John, is living a life devoted to sin and continually sinning and living in that sin. See, the difference here is I think this would be, in Matthew 6, someone who practices not forgiving. Someone who lives a life where you're unwilling to forgive other people, unwilling to ask forgiveness from your Father. That's someone whose life is not marked by love. That's someone who has not been transformed by the Holy Spirit. And so, rather than saying you're going to lose your salvation if you forget to forgive perfectly, he's saying your life should be marked by a willingness to love God, to love others, and to also forgive them as you also ask for forgiveness. When we think about this Lord's Prayer, um, this is not something we're called to do word for word, as I said at the beginning. Uh, keep in mind that imagery of a model. This is simply there to model how we should go about praying, some of the things we should be praying for that can guide us and direct us in our prayer life to help us. Um, I'm reminded of a quote that uh, a church member shared recently from John MacArthur uh, that says that we are saved, that we are justified by faith, not faithfulness, and that it's vital to understand the distinction. How lofty prayers get us nowhere. I want to encourage you, be sincere and go to the Lord in prayer. God will answer your prayers. He will hear you out and he will transform you more into his will to fit into his kingdom as we go to him and honestly, sincerely pray these things that we see modeled for us in Matthew 6. Well, I pray that this video has been helpful and beneficial for you if, as we've discussed prayer. We will meet Thursday evening on Zoom. Well, we, we will dig into this passage uh, in a little more detail and discuss a few things and how we can apply it. And until then, stay safe, stay sanitized, and God bless.